Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Cal Matters. I'm Neil Chase. I'm the CEO here at Cal Matters. Really appreciate you all coming out today for this conversation. Uh, if you don't know us, we're a nonprofit newsroom covering California policy and politics, looking at the intersection of policy and people in California and helping folks in California understand this, this government down the street that, uh, that they spend so much money for and don't always pay attention to as closely as they might want to. Um, and uh, really appreciate those of you here in person and the online audience we have as well. Uh, very important topic to talk about. We've been doing a lot of reporting. And when I say me, we, I'm primarily me and Rob Lewis, uh, one of our uh, longtime investigative reporters, uh, who's been digging into this very important story that we're going to tell you a lot more about today. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about us toward the end of this event. But uh, right now, I want to turn it over to Rob and let him uh, take it away. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, before I go to our panelists, I just want to sort of set the scene uh, for this discussion we're, we're about to have up here. Um, I think as many of you in the audience probably know, California uh, generates millions of tons of toxic waste every year. We have these tough environmental laws, but we still, we also have a, a large economy. We generate a lot of toxic waste. And, and we're talking about uh, flammable solvents used to decree, degrease parts before painting. Uh, there's corrosive liquids that tech companies use to make microchips. And then there's the, the heavy metals and the old chemicals like DDT that we're still digging up from the ground uh, to, to sort of remedy our past environmental sins. And this is stuff that can cause fires, it can explode, it can poison groundwater, and it can kill, actually. Uh, and we need to do something with it. Uh, but California's Im infrastructure for handling hazardous waste has dwindled. In the 1980s, there were more than 400 sites that could take hazardous waste. Uh, now, there are fewer than 75. I think there's 73 when I checked last night. Uh, only two are actually landfills. What's left are sites that are older, have records of violations, and often have contamination issues, and many, most of them, are in low-income communities of color. Perhaps unsurprisingly, then, we are increasingly sending our waste out of state. Uh, half the manifested waste California generates leaves the state, often to places with weaker environmental regulations. Wrapped up in all of this, our discussions of, of how we got here are, are questions about permitting, about cost, enforcement, environmental justice, and how we even define hazardous waste as a state. And here to help us grapple with these issues, um, I'm very excited, this is an amazing panel, are some very smart people who have very different roles and, and sort of views into some of these issues, and, and I'll, I'll go in order. Uh, to my left here is Chuck White. He is uh, currently a senior advisor from, from Minot. Um, he is the former director of regulatory affairs for waste management, the very large uh, waste company. Uh, and before that, he uh, actually worked in, uh, I think, the predecessor to DTSC, as, as he tells me when there were 35 people who are there. And I think it's a significantly larger agency today. Uh, to his left, your right, is Katie Butler. Uh, she's DTSC's Deputy Director for, hazardous waste, for the Hazardous Waste Management Program. And before that, she spent years working on public health and environmental issues in Los Angeles. Uh, next to her is Ryan Dominguez. He supervises DTSC's Hazardous Waste Management Plan Unit. And before government service, he worked in environmental consulting. And then next to him is Ingrid Brostrom. Uh, she is the Climate and Sustainability Program Director at UC Merced's Labor Center. And before that, she worked for a very large uh, environmental advocacy organization as Assistant Director of the Center on Race, Poverty, and the Environment. And, and just to sort of launch into it, I'm going to start with you, Ryan, because you've been really studying and diving into the, to the data around hazardous waste as part of this, this massive undertaking the state's involved in the hazardous waste management planning process. And I'm, I was just hoping you could set the scene, talk a little bit about what has happened to the infrastructure for handling hazardous waste in California, and, and maybe more to the point, how well equipped are we to actually handle our waste? Thanks, Robert. Um, I think you set it up pretty good. And I want to make sure that we are talking about it in, in a couple different ways. We have generation, we have, and, and we have management. A lot of the management happens where it's generated. Um, so there's a lot of what's called on-site treatment. And that's when you talk about permitted facilities, those are, California has a five-tier permit system. 
when you talk about the permitted facilities and the ones that have decreased over time, those are the top two per types of um, permitted facilities. Then you have these lower tiered permits, which are where the on-site treatment happens. And in 2021, we were estimating um, that there's more than 11 million tons of waste that's, that's treated on site. Then you get into the other part of it when it gets manifested. And that's where you start to get the one and a half to two million tons being generated of manifested waste. So the infrastructure for that is also there for treatment and uh, recycling and disposal. There's two hazardous waste landfills in, in California. There's 18 in the, U in the US. So the system as a whole is a national system, um, as was envisioned by the federal program. And so we are still operating in that system, and we have infrastructure here to manage the waste. But I would say, though, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's long been the, uh, you say it's a national system, but it's long been the goal of, of states to manage their own, their own waste. And do we actually have the infrastructure to manage our own waste? If you don't mind. So... You're right. The hist historically, our stated policy objective is to manage our waste in state. And on the surface, this sounds logical and reasonable, especially because we have California designated hazardous waste. And that makes up the bulk of our hazardous waste generated in the state, about 80%. And so what we're looking at now is how can we find new ways to manage that waste more efficiently in state? But the reality of the situation is we can't prohibit or stop waste from crossing state borders. That would be contrary to US commerce laws. Uh, and so that's exactly what this planning process gives us the opportunity to do, is take a fresh look at that historic policy objective to manage waste in state. How do we create a hazardous waste system that is more sustainable, supportive of a circular economy, and really protective of all Californians, especially those that are most vulnerable. And that may mean transporting waste across state lines is more efficient or has less impacts to public health and the environment. And that's exactly what we're looking at with this planning process. And, and I just, I just want to say, though, I, I mean, you said you can't tell uh, other entities, private businesses, where to send the waste. But I mean, respectfully, DTSC, your own agency, has made a decision to take its waste to other states with weaker environmental regulations. So, so you have looked at the, the economics of it and the regulations of it and decided that it's best to take the waste out of state. You're right, that we have to continually look at our own internal policies because there's trade-offs to determining where that waste is going to be disposed of. Uh, sometimes disposing of a waste in a more economical way means that we're able to clean up more properties. And those are the trade-offs that we have to continually reevaluate. It's an iterative process. Yeah, yeah. I may, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, two major hurdles, of course, is the fact that a lot of the waste that goes out of state, not all, but is not even hazardous in the state that it goes to. It's because California has much more stringent regulations. 80% of California's waste is California-only waste. About 20% is what called RICRA waste. And the other aspect of that is that the fees for disposal of hazardous waste in California are quite high. And some of the fees for disposing of hazardous waste in another state that doesn't consider it to be hazardous waste are like a, maybe a, a fraction of that fees to the state or this kind of thing. So uh, it's much cheaper to run a solid waste landfill than it is to run a hazardous waste landfill. So there's a lot of a aspects that are drawing the waste out of California. It's been a challenge to try to figure out how to address. Um, I, I want to read a, a, just a... a passage, I'm going to ask you a question, Ingrid, uh, from the Hazardous Waste Management Report uh, as, as part of the planning process. And it says, if California is to manage its own hazardous waste, it will need new facilities and new types of facilities. Uh, it's been, I, this is my wording now, it's been the conventional wisdom for a long time, it is not possible to open new hazardous waste facilities in California. Is that conventional wisdom true? How, it, how do we overcome the permitting issues, the expense, the nimbyism? How, how do you do it? Um, well, first of all, like the, the lens that I use 
in kind of a, a assessing our waste management is really the least harm, and particularly the least harm to vulnerable communities because they host so many of our hazardous waste uh, facilities in California, but also out of state. And so to me, it's a, it's a very nuanced question. Um, and I, I think one of the big issues with you know, transporting the waste out of state, as Chuck mentioned, um, you know, is that uh, you have waste that can go to municipal landfills. And they don't have the protections that they do here. At the same time, if we decide we're going to close those borders somehow, even though legally there, there's questions whether we can do that, that waste will end up in some of the most vulnerable communities in California, namely Kettleman City and Button Willow. Those are both low-income farm working communities in the Central Valley, and they take, you know, a vast majority of the hazardous waste in California, and they're some of the most vulnerable communities. So if I have been told from the time that I started working on this about two decades ago, that there will never be a new hazardous waste facility in California. So, I mean, it's been repeated so often that, you know, maybe it's become reality. Um, but if we were to really start looking at increasing capacity, you know, we would want to do so with the lens of not repeating our historic mistakes. Really, how do we keep these facilities away from communities, and a, a particularly away from vulnerable communities. Um, and if there was more of a will to do that and more of a conversation about that, you know, perhaps we can overcome this, you know, the inertia that we've long heard about. Well, you, you just opened up the issue of, of environmental justice. And, and I'd ask you this, Katie, um, you know, the sites we have in this state, as has been pointed out, are largely in communities of color. We were supposed to have regulations at the start of 2018 uh, that would wrap environmental justice up into permitting decisions, cumulative impact. Look at the cum cumulative impact of, of, of on communities when making permitting decisions. We still don't have those regs, and, and there is a passage in the report uh, that you all recently put out that says, quote, while these are important regulations as protection of our most vulnerable communities is paramount, their potential impact on the number of permitted hazardous waste facilities is an important consideration for the plan to further examine. And later questions whether the regulations are justified. It sounds like you're backing away from environmental justice in permitting decisions. And, and if you're not backing away from it, why don't we have these regulations? Thanks, Rob. Yeah, not at all backing away from it. We believe strongly that we at DTSC have to address cumulative impacts if we want to be successful in advancing environmental justice and protecting our communities uh, and protecting civil rights. And we are always looking at ways, uh, our legal tools that we already have to address cumulative impacts, not just with permitting, but across the board when it comes to corrective action and asking for a sampling plan from a responsible party or when it comes to enforcement and evaluating emissions. Uh, we can consider cumulative impacts as it stands. Now, when it comes to permitting, we do have some work to do to look at cumulative impact criteria, uh, looking specifically at community vulnerabilities. How do we incorporate specific criteria for community vulnerabilities into our permitting decisions? And we have made a lot of progress on it this year to revise a framework responsive to a lot of the stakeholder input we received in the past. Uh, and what you're going to see in the revised framework for 673 uh, to address community vulnerabilities um, is, is going to get at this issue that Ingrid brought up of learning from our past mistakes. And that means not citing industrial facilities in disproportionately in frontline communities. And um, we have to reverse that history of redlining. If I may, uh, this cumulative impact issue is a, is a really a tough one from my personal point of view because the hazardous waste facility is the one that is subject to DTSC's limitations with respect to its additional impact, but there's a number of other sources already there, and is it reasonable that the hazardous waste facility bears the full burden of having to comply or reduce uh, the cumulative impact from its operations, 
or what about a more equitable way of making sure that all sources of impacts are, are in some way contributing to that reduction, but DTSC doesn't have the authority over many of these facilities, some but not all. And how is that cumulative impact going to be uh, assessed and then assigned to the responsible parties? And it, it, an interesting factor about the Calenviro screen is the fact that there's only one kind of facility or two kinds of facilities that are specifically identified in determining what the impact is, and that's one, hazardous waste facilities, and two, solid waste facilities. So if you happen to be a hazardous waste facility or a solid waste facility, you're automatically, your score has gone up compared to all the other sources around there. Other types of industrial activities, uh, like refineries, for example, not too harsh on refineries, but they're not specifically required to be uh, identified under the Calenviro screen. So there's issues with the Calenviro screen. And when I was on the panel, when they first put the Calenviro screen together 20 years ago, it was made absolutely clear that it was never going to be used for permitting and enforcement cases. Well, that, that's exactly what has happened. And, and uh, it was supposed to be used for de determining how the state would spend its money uh, with respect to addressing concerns in communities, and but now it's become totally a permitting and enforcement issue. I, I'm, I'm getting a sense there's some disagreement over on this side of the uh, the My state. Friend Ingrid, In Ingrid oh. please. <laughs> well, I, one thing I wanted to mention in terms of what is the difference between a hazardous waste facility and many of the other industrial facilities. First, we would encourage the state of California to consider cumulative impacts and community vulnerability in in, in its, its decision to site industrial facilities you know, writ large. However, you know, uh, hazardous waste facilities in California um, are unique in that they have to get permit renewals every 10 years. That's not the case for these other industrial facilities. So every 10 years, the state and DTSC have a new opportunity to assess you know, you know, assess the compliance history of the, of the facility, assess the community around the facility. Is it appropriate that this facility continue to operate? And so that is difficult for existing other types of industrial facilities, but we have a unique opportunity with hazardous waste facilities to, to take that look uh, in, in 10 years. And, and that requirement is because hazardous waste facilities are such a high risk you know, and if there are compliance issues, if there are, you know, communities and schools starting to abut these facilities, which is happening, which has happened, you know, we have an opportunity in the state of California to say enough is enough. This is no longer an appropriate land use when you have children, you know, just a block down the road. I, can I just ask, there, there's, I feel like we can talk a specific company. It, there was, um, I did some reporting early in the year on, on fiber tech. FiberTech is is uh, uh, recycle spent etchants for the tech industry. It's recycling. We we purportedly want that. Um, they also have the oldest expired permit in the state. It's almost it's been almost thirty years that they've been operating on an expired permit. They've had nineteen class one violations. Uh, excuse me, I'm saying that wrong. They've had class one violations in nineteen separate inspections far more than 19 actual violations. They they had contamination on site that wasn't cleaned up in a timely manner. How do you keep them open if, if at the back of your mind, you're not making the calculus, we have to because we need this capacity? Fibrotech is a great concrete example to talk through this exact issue. Uh, it's one of the oldest permits, uh, like you said. And we came out what, what, what we thought was a really strong permit. Hundreds of conditions, strict oversight, specific requirements, uh, to make sure that hazardous waste is being managed safely and appropriately at FibroTech. Uh, and we heard from the community over several public comment periods that they want, you know, they think that we can do better. And we even heard from the LA County Health Department on uh, additional steps that they thought we should take. And so, the public comment period is a great example of how those cumulative impact and community vulnerability concerns can be raised. And then we're obligated as the regulatory agency to address those. And that's what we're doing now with the FibroTech permit is we're looking at those public comments we received, the lived experience from the community that is uh, almost 500 feet away. They're, they're very close to this facility. And we're 
we're looking at those permit conditions um, so that we can come out with even a stronger permit. You mentioned the compliance history. They do have a very poor track record, especially in the early 2000s. Uh, they have a better track record in the last few years, and they're compliant with all of our asks when it comes to cleaning up the corrective action on site. So we do have to take that into account. And then we also have to take into account that if we were to deny the permit, FibroTech could still theoretically operate because they could use raw materials instead of hazardous waste to run its operations. So we've been talking about capacity uh, and I don't want to say table capacity, but if, uh, if we can't increase the amount of space to take hazardous waste in California, then the other side of the equation is, can we reduce hazardous waste? Um, and and I, I want to go to you, Ingrid, because um, you know historically we've talked about hazardous waste reduction programs. It sure seemed like uh, regulators are considering a different way to reduce hazardous waste with a whole lot of talk about uh, reassessing our regulations and how we determine things are hazardous waste. What was your reaction when you read the, the hazardous waste management report? I, I found the report somewhat concerning, um, it, you know, in particular because it was leading so much with capacity rather than the harm reduction or avoidance and public health lens. Um, be, I mean, and one concern is um, if we lead with capacity, then there is a pressure to keep facilities open by any means possible to avoid reducing capacity further. And that could keep facilities artificially open that shouldn't be open, you know, such as FibroTech. Um, and, 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 and I want to bring up Exide. You know, uh, if folks are not familiar, it's, a, it's one of the most contaminated sites in the history of California. And it was a lead acid battery recycling facility in the middle of, you know, low income community in Los Angeles. And, you know, there's only two uh, battery recycling facilities in California. And the argument before it was finally sh shut down was if we close Exide, where are the batteries going to go? And it artificially kept open, a, it was used as an argument to keep open a facility that was doing so much damage to the local community, like untold, you know, millions of dollars of, of cleanup. Um, and so that's why, to me, leading with capacity is difficult. If you start leading with a harm reduction or harm avoidance lens, then the hazardous waste reduction um, uh, uh, proposals, you know, that will cover both issues. That will help decrease the burden of the capacity and will reduce burdens on communities that right now are located in those communities. So we had the pollution prevention program discontinued in 2012. You know, the fact that the state of California has no pollution prevention program in place right now, that's astonishing. You know, Chuck and I sat on a, a, a committee, um, you know, um, about six, seven years ago, really the focus was, you know, how are we going to reduce waste in California? We spent a lot of time. That report got shelved. It has not been used. We have identified waste streams that have not been used. You know, uh. so, so we need to do more. And I just want to mention contaminated soils make up over 50% of our hazardous waste in California. And we cannot really talk uh, about really reducing burdens without addressing the contaminated soil question. Well, let's talk about contaminated soil then. Um, you know, you talk. There are any number of scientists who suggest uh, we have too strict interpretations of, of hazardous waste as it relates to contaminated soils here in California. The argument is is that uh, uh, heavy metals don't migrate through the soil very well. Modern uh, liners are equipped to handle. Uh, handle this type of waste. Um, you know, do is it time to change the regulations around contaminated soil? Or I, I'm gonna start with Katie, but I, I or or either of you, or Ryan, if you want to weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, we have to be open to new ways to reduce waste, which means looking at this issue exactly of contaminated soil. And do you want to sp speak to some more specifics? Yeah, I, I can touch on that a bit. Um, right now in the planning process, we're looking at opportunities for reduction. Contaminated soil is the first one that we're looking at. And, and the um, potential f for DTSC to, to encourage reduction in that space. Um, soil is difficult because it's so dependent on site specifics, the constituent. 
um, where it is located, where the contamination is located, how close it is to the water table. A lot of considerations that go in to can it be done. Um, the primary purpose of a cleanup is to remove potential exposure to a human and for protection of groundwater. And you have to look at that and see if you can um, do something else other than remove the soil. Chuck, you, you have some history in this, this area. You've seen a lot of discussions around this, and it seems like there's a headline problem, right? Like you can't, how, does, how do we uh, actually have a, a good faith analysis of, of the uh, criteria for what we consider hazardous waste, particularly uh, contaminated soil, when you're going to see a headline that says California wants to loosen regulations and bring hazardous waste to a dump near you? Yeah, the, the, the first issue, uh, you said half Ingrid is, is uh, contaminated soil. It's half of the manifested waste. Is, is ha the, other, the vast majority of hazardous waste are managed on site with a discharge to the sewer, for example, and then the resultant residuals maybe get manifested off for disposal. Um, there was a, a attempt under Governor Duke Majan uh, many years ago called the Regulatory Structure Update when Jess Huff was the director of the department. And that idea was to maybe cut back on some of the California's overly stringent uh, regulations on defining what con is considered to be a hazardous contaminated soil. And there was a huge blowback from the environmental community that they did not want to see that. They wanted to see these this kind of contamination managed in the most protective facilities available, that being hazardous waste facilities. And so I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm nervous about how that debate's going to go proceed if we decide to go that route again. Uh, but you're, you're, you're right. It's a, it's a real struggle when you have cheaper opportunities out of state to, to manage those wastes. And that there's, if you, can't, you can't regulate that very easily because of the Commerce Clause. So uh, yeah, Ryan, it's going to be interesting. You, Ryan, you want to jump in? And, there, and there's two parts to that evaluation that we're doing is the criteria evaluation. And, we're, and one is how hazardous waste is identified, and the other part is how it's managed. And so we're, we're looking at both parts. How it's identified is one question, and what, I, what this seems to be more about is how it's managed. Um, you, Robert, you, you mentioned um, new facilities. Yeah. Well, one of the other questions is for alternative management, do our current, how, what are current facilities doing? What other facilities, are, are there things that exist now that would be as protective? And so that's part of the evaluation. What, how are other landfills constructed? Um, back when our criteria were first being dreamed up, um, the assumption and the thought was, okay, these are going to an unlined landfill with no leachate collection. Well, is that still the case in, mo in the majority of landfills? And that's what we're looking at for alternative management. And then we dig into the more of the technical, what are the liners like, what level of protection, what wastes. And so those are some of the assessments that we're going through through this planning process. And this whole conversation about the generation of hazardous waste, what it is and where it goes, is a perfect example of why this is an iterative process and why it's going to take some time to th look at all of these tough questions and dig into the science and the engineering behind it and, and reevaluate the, pro the program. Let, let's talk about that sort of iterative process. I mean, there was already mention of a, uh, of a panel they were on where there was a report and nothing happened. And I think if you look at the history of DTSC, there's a lot of task force, there's a lot of committees, there's a whole heck of a lot of reports that could probably fill a lot of shelves in this office. And, and at the end of the day, it seems like a lot of these very difficult decisions and questions get punted down the road. Why is there any hope? And maybe I'll, I'll start with Chuck. I mean, or ask Chuck. Why is is there any hope that this is actually different, or have we seen this show before? Well, that group that we Ingrid and I served on a few years ago, uh, there was some issues that it, very expensive to treat contaminated soils, and you have to have a treatment facility cited and permitted to treat those soils, and then what are you going to do with those soils? You're going to put them, probably put them back in the same spot, presumably cleaned up. And I think that this pretty much decision, at least from the folks I was working with on that panel, were feeling it was really going to be expensive and even maybe a worse situation than simply the current process of taking facilities to hazardous waste facilities in state and disposing of them. Um, and so uh, it's 
it seemed to me that it was basically uh, impractical to figure out how we were going to economically do that and logistically do that kind of treatment of contaminated soils. But I have to say one thing, and I all due respect to Ingrid, she's done a great job representing the people that, that, she, that she's responsible for. But the thing that seems to me is missing is that so much progress has been made in California since when I first started working on hazardous waste issues back in the 1980s. We, we had Casmalia, a hazardous waste disposal site that was completely failing. I was involved in a, a cleanup of a major salvage in Bay Area, San Leandro, which was hundreds, not thousands, of drums leaking on a vacant lot that the guy had just rented to store some chemicals for, for purpose of recycling later. Those are gone now. We don't have those kinds of facilities anymore. And we've made tremendous progress. And are we 100% there? No, we've got more work to do. But the last thing you want to do is shut down the remaining hazardous waste facilities. They may not all be perfect, but they're better than what was here before, and they're on, they're on a path of surviving and trying to do better and better and better. And if they can't do better, maybe, well, maybe shut them down. But the, the, the remaining hazardous waste facilities that are permitted or scheduled to be permitted are better than anything we, we, we saw before. And there was hundreds of facilities that were managing hazardous waste illegally back in the, in the 1970s and 1980s before hazardous waste came along. Ingrid, uh, you, you looked like you wanted to jump in there. Um, what? <laughs> you wouldn't contradict that, would you? <laughs> Please. Well, uh, well, two, two points. One to just you know, mention about you know, the progress made. Um, you know, the, the fact of the disproportionate impact of hazardous waste on low-income communities and communities of color was one of the very first environmental justice issues that was identified back in the 1980s with the Hazardous Waste and Race Report. They actually did an update 20 years later, and they found that the disparities in California actually got worse during that time. So the, despite the fact that we, we had knowledge of the disparities, we had this report, we had all this advocacy and efforts on, on behalf of environmental justice communities, things in fact did not get better if, if you look at it again from the lens of our, you know, like how we impact the most vulnerable communities in the state. So from that measure, things have not gotten better. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention with contaminated soils, you know, I've worked with a lot of communities and they're not a monolith. They, they all have very, you know, different ideas. And you will get some communities saying, you know, I don't want the soil in my community because as long as it's just, a, it's just capped and, the, and the, the contamination is still in the soil, I'm at risk. And so those communities, sometimes they see the best option as taking that soil to a hazardous waste landfill. But a lot of other communities, you know, they're very attuned to this idea of we don't want to just shift the burden. We don't want our burden to go to Kettleman City or Button Willow. And so they're invested in an idea of like, can we figure out a destruction in place, an institute treatment where you're removing the contamination, you're removing the chemicals, but you're doing it on site. Um, and so there is an actual, a lot, of, a lot of openness from communities to look into that. And I know right now, I, I'm on another panel at DTSC at this moment, where we're looking at bioremediation. We're looking at alternatives that really haven't been discussed because so much of it, one, is cost-driven, and two, the decisions of the responsible parties. They get such a big role in deciding, you know, what remedy they're going to select that they never even get down the path of looking at any alternative than dig and haul or cap on site. Um, let me let me just. We're about to go to Q and A, but before we do, I, d I do want to ask you, Ryan. Um, you know, you've been working on this hazardous waste management report for a while, and um, you know, it does seem we can get stuck in conventional wisdom, right? Like the the issue of we, we can never open another facility in the state. That's conventional wisdom. I wonder what surprised you. Like as you were as you were digging into the data, as you were digging into policy and learning. Like, was there anything in there that surprised you and changed sort of conventional wisdom for you? I think the main thing for me was I, I didn't expect that 80% of the waste that was generated since 2010 was non-RICRA or Cal hazardous in California. That was, that was surprising me. Um, and so that's, it made me kind of pause and like, wow, that's really interesting. And so it made me want to understand more of what it is. It speaks to one of the data gaps that we have. Um, when something when something gets put on a manifest, when waste gets put on a manifest to get shipped off site, um, it uses a coding system. And that coding system doesn't always tell us what the waste is. It just says like contaminated soil is number six eleven. 
okay? Um, and so what we're trying to do now is, is better understand that. And that was kind of the, emphasis, or the impetus for diving into that waste stream. And why is, why is non-recreational waste so much? And well, there, I, I can, California was the first one to adopt standards for identifying hazardous waste. And when it came up to the federal government to decide what kind of standards, there was a huge blowback from many states, as we see in many other issues today. We don't want to do what California is doing. <laughs> uh, it's too, too restrictive, too uh, excessive. And so basically they adopted test procedures that are not quite as aggressive as uh, California adopted. Uh, Bob Stevens, uh, who I worked with over at the Department of Health Services, was the lead scientist on developing California's hazardous waste identification standards, and he thought he, they were the best standards available. And he didn't. He thought Rick would let drop the ball and not uh, fell under the pressure of other states uh, rather than California's lead. Kate, Kate did you want to jump in? I was going to add as far as the data points. I think. All of our team, we were pleasantly surprised to see that for RICRA hazardous waste, there's actually a decreasing trend, which speaks to the fact that there is reduction in recycling happening on site at these generators, like Ryan mentioned. And uh, to Ingrid's point about you know the focus of capacity in the report, I would disagree. We adhere to the waste hierarchy model that prioritizes alternative materials above anything else before even creating hazardous waste, then and then recycling, reducing. Disposal is a last resort. Uh, and as far as the soil contamination conversation earlier, you mentioned weakening criteria. No, California is not going to weaken criteria. If we change or propose any kind of alternative, alternative management standards or we propose new waste criteria, they're going to be based on the best available science, the latest research, and now we're funded and we have the resources to do that. So that's why I think it's different now. The timing is different. And I'm feeling the momentum, the energy from all of the stakeholders across the board, the communities that Ingrid spoke to who are open to all alternative in-situ treatments. Those are exciting conversations for us to have. Um, the regulated community that wants to bring recycling in state, how do we, how do we facilitate, facilitate a regulatory paradigm that is protective of health and the environment, but also promotes legitimate recycling, a circular economy? There's a lot of waste out there that are still going to be heading your direction, things like lithium-ion batteries, which you may, but some of you may have heard about. <laughs> they, they're quite hazardous, and there's going to be a lot of them in the future. Solar panels are going to be a lot of those in the future, and they're probably hazardous. So it's not like hazardous waste is going to go away. And who's responsible for generating the hazardous waste? Uh, who has an electric car? Who has a solar panel? Uh, it's, it's all of us uh, are contributing to the generation of hazardous waste, and we, you need to make sure it's managed appropriately and efficiently. And I would again come back to the argument that the worst of the problems have been eliminated over the last 20, 30 years. Things like Casmalia, things like major salvage. Kettleman Hills, for example, I used to work for waste management, don't anymore. Uh, the, the closest resident in, in Kettleman City is four, four and a half miles away. I live in Davis, and the solid waste landfill is two miles away from my house, and there's eight uh, Superfund sites in various degrees in progress in Davis, California. Davis, <laughs> I feel pretty safe in Davis, quite frankly, and, uh, but I still am. We're all surrounded by these legacies of things that have happened in the past, and by shutting down additional recycling facilities like FiberTech would be a disaster. You need to make sure these things get better, not eliminate them, and make sure they're available to continue recycling in the best managed form. And no one's perfect, I can tell you. Uh, having been in the, in the hazardous waste game, people make mistakes all the time. But you've got to hold their feet to the fire and make them get better, not, not eliminate them altogether. R Ryan, really quick, you, you talked about data gaps uh, as you were putting this report together. I'm, I'm curious, um, foreign exports. Is, are you analyzing at all uh, the waste that is leaving, our uh, manifested waste that's leaving the country? We looked a little bit at it. Um, I think Katie can, can speak to it better than I can. Um, it's not something that we have a lot of data on, but it has come up in our workshops on the hazardous manage, waste management report uh, that 
we need to consider the public health ramifications of our decision for our system here globally. We're in a global economy. It only makes sense that we have to consider those global impacts. Uh, and it's gonna depend on you know, access to data and it's going to be a long-term process for us to look at those. Well, uh, do we have a responsibility as a state to be uh, ensuring the waste that leaves California is handled uh, in a safe and manner for, for other communities? I, I think we have a responsibility to make sure our decisions here in the state, they don't disproportionately impact other vulnerable communities, and that may mean vulnerable communities in other countries, absolutely. And are we doing that? Are we ensuring that? No, that's gonna be part of this planning process, and like I said, it's gonna take um, an, multiple plans. Every three years, we get a chance to update the data the, and the plan. Mm -hmm. I think all of the, these are representative of why capacity is important. This is why we identified it as one of the key factors that we need to go and look into because it does help reduce impacts and because it represents appropriate management and, uh, and a, an appropriate way to um, manage waste that otherwise would be mismanaged. Let's, um, we're gonna open it up to, to comments from the audience. Uh, if you have a, a question, please raise your hand. Uh, someone will be coming around with a microphone. Uh, Jordan Wells with the National Stewardship Action Council, and we advocate for extended producer responsibility um, to achieve an equitable circular economy. And so my question is, is what role do you think that the producers should play in, um, a, in a solution to this problem? Well, I can jump into that at my own risk. But, uh, <laughs> uh, my friends in the industrial community, but uh, it's the way with the future. There's every session of the California legislature has additional topics to pick up on extended producer responsibility. What's going to happen to lithium-ion batteries? What's going to happen to solar panels? It's going to be a continuing trend where the producers of these materials don't just turn over the responsibility to the ultimate buyer. They're going to have to have some continuing responsibility. What that is, that's going to be open for debate. But that whole thing is sweeping the nation, as I'm sure you know, probably better than I do. But everybody's looking towards California, what California's doing with extended producer responsibility. And I think that trend's going to continue. Question? Next question, excuse me. <coughs> uh, front row here, Lynch, take my mic. Sticking with the lithium battery solar panels, since California wants to be first in the nation for everything, and California had to know that lithium was toxic when they started to promote lithium batteries and solar panels, did the legislature have a plan going forward of what they were going to do with the toxic waste? Well, there's a number of people that are looking at capturing and recycling lithium rather than mining it. Uh, I, ha I happen to represent a, 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 a uh, utility that has uh, ability to break lithium out of um, underground water when it comes up. So there's, there's ways you can reduce the impact um, rather than direct mining of uh, lithium soils or lithium deposits. Uh, but you got to find, you want to get back to recycling lithium and rather than you, you doing it to the greatest degree possible. And that's going to be happening. And there aren't a whole lot of lithium recycling, but there's a lot of technologies out there being considered right now. Uh, and I, I just think it'll happen. And I think that there's going to have to be a responsibility by the people that produce the batteries to make sure that there are end of life. But to answer my question, you didn't have a plan going forward. Well, no Katie, do you, want to, do you want to weigh in on the regulatory side? So from the department's perspective, uh, we are being contacted by lithium battery recyclers to do business in California, and we're hopeful that the streamlining we've done to our permitting process will encourage them to support the circular economy here. Um, so it kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier. What we can do as a department is look at our regulatory framework so that we're supporting those kind of circular economy activities here. That very, very well involve new facilities that are going to have to be cited to be able to process these lithium. There's going to be a lot of lithium ion batteries coming down. Yeah, and a challenge we're hearing is, you know, there's a stigma attached with a hazardous waste permit. And we've talked about how we haven't seen any new permits in a very long time. Uh, and so, you know, now is our opportunity to revisit completely how, how we're regulating recycling in a responsible, safe way, but 
in a way that encourages a sustain, sustainable way. Fact check me on this, Ryan, but I, I believe your office told me that there's been no new RICRA commercial permits since the early 80s. Yes. Um, one of the things that were mentioned uh, was with companies such as FiberTech, um, what are the steps that you think that should be taken to just make it better since you say that the solution is to not to like close them down, but rather make them better? Where do you think they should start if there's so many issues that there are like violations that they already have? What's like the best way, like the best way for them to just like start to make it better? rather than shutting them down. My own personal opinion is they are right now. They're trying to do, do the best job possible uh, uh, that they have resources for. And, they're, and my, I guess my point is they're not the worst. The worst are already gone. They're not operating anymore. They're not perfect, uh, but they really, uh, if you talk to the, the lead person there, and I, I don't represent FiberTech, but they're, they, they honestly get it. They're a little bit frustrated that California is coming down so hard on them, but they want to do, they want to do the right thing, and they want to be surviving. And if California wants them to survive, because we're gonna, I think we're going to have fewer or, or, or more uh, electronic waste in the future. I mean, it's, it's exactly the kind of facility that we should be citing and expanding to be able to make sure we don't dump them into the nearest stream like it used to be done. You don't represent FiberTech, but don't you represent Cometco? I mean, how long? Well, Cometco has been purchased by uh, Ecobat, right? Ecobat, correct. How, how? And they have, they have, they're, the, they're the last remaining battery recycling facility west of the Mississippi River, and it is. Uh, and it doesn't handle all of California's batteries, but it handles a lot of them. It is not a disposal facility. Do you, does anybody know what the what, which commodity is the highest recycling rate in California? lead acid batteries. It has the highest recycling rate uh, of any material, hazardous or not hazardous. It's just incredible. There's a demand for it. We'd rather do that than mine the lead. Let's re re recycle the lead and do it in the safest manner possible. And personally, I mean, I would encourage anybody that is down there, take a tour of the Echobat, uh, used to be Cometco facility in City of Industry, and it is an amazing facility, and they're doing everything they can to protect uh, the workers and the community around them. But uh, there's right, there's, there's complaints about them. There's no question about In it. Ingrid? Yeah, I, I, I want to make the point that at, at some point, having a hazardous waste facility is incompatible with the adjacent land uses. And, you know, the Central Valley may have the largest landfills in the state, but Los Angeles has many hazardous waste facilities are located in neighborhoods. You know, FiberTech has three schools, you know, within a mile. You know, the closest resident is like 400 feet away. Like, it is in a residential neighborhood. And so, I mean, I think my, my question to my answer and, and Quimeco too, is sometimes there is inherent risk to having hazardous waste. There's a stigma to having a hazardous waste facility. There's fear that causes like real biological impacts to the body of having a hazardous waste facility that close. And so at a certain point, you know, the state really needs to make a decision about is this continuing to be a suitable land use when there's so many residential and sensitive receptors nearby. And I think at a certain point, and with the regulations that are long overdue around cumulative impacts, you know, at a certain point we have to say, enough is enough, this facility doesn't belong in this community. And again, I point out that I live in Davis, where I have got, within five miles, a solid waste landfill and up to eight various degrees of Superfund sites within that five mile radius. So uh, we'd like to get away from hazardous waste and pretend it doesn't exist. In fact, I would make the argument that one of the biggest problems with hazardous waste is this name. Uh, if we called it bananas or something like that, we wouldn't have the same problem. But uh, it's, it's uh, it, so, so we, ha we have to take... It's, it's a <laughs> yeah. branding problem well, for hazardous we have, waste? We, have, that the, we all have to take responsibility for the industrial the society cancer. that we or, live in. Well, or the flames. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, you wanted to jump Well, if in. I can give some examples of stronger permit conditions. Um, for example, community air monitoring locations, uh, odor surveillance, um, and this is not specific just to FibroTech, but across the board on some of our newer permits, stronger financial assurance requirements so that we don't end up with another Exide and 
uh, you know, that facility is held accountable for closure costs and cleanup costs through that, that financial assurance requirement in our newer permits. Um, a community health and safety plan, for example, for better communication, transparency with the local residents on what kind of operations are happening. Um, you know, what if there is uh, an upset event? What is the community supposed to do? Being prepared for those types of contingency plans um, and regular reporting of data to the public on websites that's more accessible. So really modernizing how those industrial facilities interact and be um, communicative with local residents and yeah. other businesses in that's the area. That's exactly what they need to do, what you're doing, is, is don't shut down the remaining facilities that are the best of what we're here, but let's do everything we can to make sure they get better and improve upon them. And I think everybody in the industrial community, FiberTech, uh, Ecobat, will we'll, we'll agree with that, but we've got to do it in a sensible... At the same time, if the facility can't comply with those newer requirements, then we have no problem shutting them down. Well, in the case of... Uh, um, Exide, that was a company that was run by a bunch of investors that weren't in the battery business, and they had no interest in providing additional financial assurance, even though that was offered to them to do that. They didn't want to because they didn't. That wasn't part of their business plan, and that that's not the case with Ecobat. It's not the case with uh, other types of facilities, and I believe FiberTech falls within that same category. Uh, the gentleman back there has a question. Yeah. So I'd like to address the capacity for enforcement. Uh, this was part of the topic here today. If you are treating on in, in situ more frequently with greater tonnages, you have to have somebody looking at the enforcement. I was general counsel of ETSC for several years, and I spent the next 16 years enforcing hazardous waste laws criminally. And I happen to know this, when I left the shop, there was about 12 cops. And the district attorney's offices had about six statewide that did occasionally has this waste cases the attorney general had nobody and they took two million dollars or something out of the shop for defense work so there was no budget and no cops 10 and no district attorney investigators three or four alameda county strong san mateo la one one and one so how are you possibly going to enforce any aspect of these in situ treatments if you don't have an enforcement superstructure available to you. Katie? I'm so glad you brought up enforcement. <laughs> it's so key to the whole system working properly. And we did get additional enforcement resources through reform. Our Office of Criminal Investigations, the size has doubled from about 20 to 40 just in the last couple years. Uh, and we also have a new and more robust COOPA and COOPA training and evaluation unit. Uh, the COOPA, the local county entities that have oversight agency, uh, oversight authority over those generators, um, those, are, those are key to a statewide enforcement system. And we have tremendous support from Cal EPA right now to increase enforcement uh, amongst the COOPAs and at DTSC, we'll support them every step of the way. Uh, we have some initiatives to go out together with Koopas uh, to do additional enforcement. And it's a tall order. It's, it's, it's a tall order to do enforcement across the state, but it's, it's going to be key. Koopas are civil. That's, and, and, and what is your budget for prosecutors statewide? that actually do the prosecution, so what is your we budget? did, I can't speak exactly to our budget, but we do have more staff in our legal office now to work more closely with the Office of Criminal Investigation, and we work very closely with the county DAs uh, to refer criminal cases whenever appropriate. Um, but, I, you know, it's a really good point that you're bringing up is has, has the AG's office replaced uh, or found a replacement for the circuit prosecutors uh, program, the, the one that placed uh, prosecutors in, in sort of more rural DA's offices to handle criminal environmental cases? I don't know, but I know we work closely with the AG's office on 
a no, number of enforcement I, I cases. I have to know that. No, I talked to Rams uh, okay. Butte County yesterday. There's one in Auburn. So, you, you know, I, I mean, I don't want to be harsh, but talk about a plan is not dollars in hired prosecutors doing the job. I shut down Covanta's six facilities. It took five district attorney's offices. The attorney general didn't participate. It was a hazardous waste disposal issue. And we had to do it ourselves with one Butte County deputy district attorney and a few part-time guys in Kern. And, and there's no infrastructure, there's no superstructure to do this. And, and, and it's been decades of people telling us that there's a plan. So you really have to like come back to us and say, yeah, there's this amount of money. Yeah, I hired 12 prosecutors. Each county has two prosecutors. There are 44 different de deputy district attorney investigators. We executed 45 search warrants last month. That's what we need, not a plan. We need actual behaviors. Thank you. Yeah, I can tell you we, you know, we hired at least half a dozen of new investigators in our criminal investigation office this year. Um, but I'm hearing that enforcement has to be a key piece of this hazardous waste management effort. Um, I'm going to pull it back and just ask one sort of final question before we wrap up here and, and, and just really want to thank everyone before I do for, for being on this panel and this great discussion and the audience as well for your great questions. Um, just a forward looking question in, in brief. I mean, if you could enact one policy change today to address these issues that we're talking about uh, and have been talking about, what would you do? I mean, what is priority number one? And, and we'll go left to right. Well, I would certainly put a high priority on making sure we have facilities in California to recycle hazardous waste uh, and, and keep those operating. They may not be perfect, but let's do everything we can because they're a heck of a lot better than what we used to have. Uh, and let's keep operating that and put that highest priority on getting to recovery and recycling of hazardous materials and return them to hopefully beneficial use. So I don't think it's going to take one policy, <laughs> and I don't even think there's a few simple policy levers to solve this problem. Uh, it's, it's a complex system. It's going to take the collective effort of all of our stakeholders, multiple state and local agencies, and um, you know, the regulated community uh, to solve this. Um, and yeah. I'll echo that. And the one thing that I, I would do would be um, encourage access to capacity uh, for m all types of management, recycling, treatment, recycling especially, because what we're looking forward to is more support of a circular type of economy and that recyclers really represent a, a big piece of that. Yeah, it, it is very difficult to choose one, um, but you know, one that I think is critically important and that's not talked enough is the pollution prevention angle here. Um, the former pollution prevention program was was completely voluntary, um, and I would I would suggest that California adopt a mandatory pollution prevention based on uh, best available control technology used for air quality control. So, as you're able to figure out industrial processes that reduce the amount of production or generation of hazardous waste, those become mandatory over over time as they become achievable. I'll, I'll second Ingrid's suggestion. Um, well, again, thank you to our wonderful panelists. If everyone could please give a little round of applause to thank them for their time. Thank you all so much for the time, for being here, and to all of you. Um, you know, this story obviously affects people all over the place, right? Robert's reporting has been picked up by news organizations across California, Utah, Arizona. The Arizona Republic took this uh, first story that Robert did in the series. Uh, renamed it Toxic Neighbors and put it on their front page for everybody in Arizona to see on a Sunday morning. Um, there is more reporting coming on this project uh, across the, the western region here as we keep working on it. Uh, and such an important topic for us all to follow. I, I would like to ask you one thing. If you don't follow Cal Matters yet, we have a daily newsletter called What Matters. There's a QR code in the back. You can sign up or go to calmatters.org slash newsletters. Uh, love to have you get our daily newsletter so that we can stay in touch with you. Uh, and if you're so inclined, we are a nonprofit organization. We exist and we do this work 100% on donations from the people who care about it. So we very much appreciate your support. Thanks to all the people who joined us online today. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't invite you online, but those of you in the room, if you'd like to join us in the newsroom, there's some food uh, still here for lunch. And uh, we'll see you all at the next one of these. Thanks so much for coming.
read Cal Matters religiously. Excellent. And I highly recommend it as an excellent. Uh, Thank you. You get the first sandwich for saying that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.